Hey, Aaron. Can you hear me? Hello. Oh, there you are. Hi, how are you doing? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. I'm Kim. Hi, Kim. The associate producer and casting director at um, San Diego Rep. But I have a confession. We have met. Oh. And you will probably have no memory of this, or maybe you do. So I believe in 2003. Wow. You had a play running in Philadelphia called Brief Interviews with Hideous Men. <laughs> wow. And I was sent by my employer at the time, uh, Ariel Tepper, now uh -huh. Ariel Tepper Madover. Sure. Producer, to go and scout your play. Wow. And I went with my, with my husband. Were we married? Anyway. <laughs> and we watched it and it made an impression on me. Um, I found it very funny and I thought your actors were, were actually <laughs> really brilliant. Um, it's an interesting thought to wonder if that play would fly now, right? But, yeah. but anyway, and then I, I went back to New York and I told Ari and Rachel, my two bosses, about it. And we brought you in. Do you remember that? You came to the office. Yeah, I do remember <laughs> that. Yeah, yeah, wow, that's a long time ago. So that was because of me. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you. Um, wow, that's crazy. That show, that, in that down in that basement for the yes. first Well, that's right. It felt like a dungeon a little bit. Yeah, it did feel a lot like a dungeon. I was very proud of that show. I think that show, and I think his writing, I mean. Well, he's incomparable. <laughs> and, and dead. Um, well, yes. Um, but yeah, no, he's an incredible writer and it's a, and I, I, yeah, I think I was disappointed that that show didn't go further and that I do think in fact, in some ways it's, um, as, as controversial as it would be, it was telling, I mean, it was, it's, it, it was just telling the truth about, it, Absolutely. It was just telling the truth about the way, about the, the, the insane dysfunction of men, uh, and, uh, Wow, that's uh, I haven't Isn't thought of that show for a long time, but that's uh, <laughs> surprise. That's, that's amazing. That's that's wild. Well, it's uh, funny because you know we met and um, and uh, it was you and a, and maybe it was your I don't know, your producing partner. It was a, there were two of you. Yeah, it was like either I can't. I think it was probably Scott Scott Greer who had been. Scott Greer, one of the actors, that was an interesting project too because Scott had been the one who had read the book and instigated it and he had gotten a grant to do it. So he hit, so one of the two actors, he had brought in his friend and he had brought in Michael Hollinger and I. Right. The Kurgan director. And so it was right. the four of us. We were sort of equal partners on that production, um, which was the only time I've ever sort of done that where the four of us were really a team and then we sort of separated off into director, dramaturg, actor, actor as the, as the process went on. But it was a it was a different kind of creation process. So as I recall, and I promise we will get to JQA, but <laughs> it's kind of fun to go down memory yeah. lane a little bit. But um, as I recall, there was a review in like Variety or something like mm -hmm. that, which is what caught Ari and Rachel's interest. And so they sent me over there. Yeah. Um, yeah, you know, through sort of the 2020 lens, <laughs> looking back on it, um, I'm not, I don't know if, if I would have been like as, I don't know, because I remember being so fascinated, right? Because right. to me, the sort of dark inner corners of the male brain, that's, that's an area I actually like to venture into and explore cause, because it's fascinating to me. Um, nowadays, I wonder if that's something that people are like as interested in, but I, I found it to be a really compelling piece and even theatrical, even with the, it was a two person play, right? Yeah, so right. it was just, uh, yeah. and, and really a lot of direct address. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, and so, so I, anyway, I, I obviously liked it because I recommended that well, we meet you. Yeah, I mean, it's an interesting, it, I found it really interesting because, you know, I also had the experience, this was the first time that this had ever happened to me, where a woman came up to me after she saw it and said, um, you know, you're one of the creators, yes. And she said, I really hated this play. This was really, <laughs> I really was frustrated by this, and blah, yeah. blah, blah. And then I got an e email from her a week later. And she said, hi, I'm the one who came up and talked to you after the show. Um, 
I think I have to contradict myself in that while the play really bothered me and I really didn't enjoy watching it, I've been talking about it yes. every day for the last week to everybody I know. Therefore, by that standard, I actually loved your play. <laughs> for it. And so that was really interesting. And there was a fair amount of feedback of that. Like it is like a, there are a number of plays out there now, right? Where it's, um, it isn't, it wasn't ever necessarily designed to be fun. It was right. designed to provoke, to engage and to, you know, I remember when I first read that book, I was somebody, I was, you know, when back in 2003, well, that's nearly 20 years ago. Right. I was single and I had commitment issues. And when I read the issue, the one of the pieces that was about a guy with commitment issues, I, I remember reading it going like, how do you understand this so well? Yeah. This is just one of the 25 different dysfunctions you write about. And you've <laughs> nailed, like you've, you've, you've shown my horrible inner soul. I mean, there was like, you know, one of the, one of the common responses of men to that, to that book and to that production was a lot like, um, you're not supposed to ever say that out loud. Exactly. Like, you're not supposed to tell anyone that exactly. that's the way we think. Oh, but see, yeah. it's that kind of, uh, you know, that kind of truth and that kind of boldness that really appealed to me just as a human being, you know, just to be able to hear um, and and sort of experience what that's like. Absolutely. And, and I think that, if I may, transition a little bit to your work now. Um, and, and certainly your other writings um, and your other plays and your other adaptations. Uh, I feel like that's what you have continued to try to do is, is strip away the artifice mm -hmm. of um, human behavior. <laughs> it's interesting, you know, I don't, I don't think of, uh, I don't think of brief interviews that, that often because it wasn't, you know, it wasn't a core piece that I had developed. I was brought into sure. it. I loved it. And I did hope it was, we brought Howard Shalowitz down from Woolley at the time and really hoped that they would pick it up because I thought it was a very Woolley play. Um, but, as we've just literally, as we've been talking about it, and I think of, I think it's pretty, you know, like some of the stuff even that's in JQA in the in the Andrew Jackson scene or the um, where even the sort of the the indictment of like you you see you say you care, but how much do you really care? Right. That it sort of indict. I mean, there there's been a there's been a fair amount of stuff that I've written in all of my plays that is trying to say like, yeah, actually. Can we actually tell, tell the truth under the truth? The truth, there's the, there's the sort of safe truth that we tell, but there is another truth under that that's harder. It may or may not be true for you, but it is true for some people. So that is definitely something that I'm trying to get at. So it seems like, you know, in the last, um, I guess, decade or so, when you've started to really gain traction as a playwright, mm -hmm. um, you've focused more on adapting classical work mm -hmm. and I'm wondering what it is about classical work that you feel is necessary to update um, through your perspective. Well I feel like if, if, the, if the work can still speak directly I was just I was having a conversation last night about Shaw about Man and Superman which I'm directing with some graduate students right now and Shaw is one of my favorite playwrights but um, I haven't felt the need to adapt Shaw because I feel like Shaw still speaks directly to the moment because mm -hmm. he was so ahead of his time and so radical. His plays, as they are, can still speak passionately to the moment that we're in. Whereas Chekhov, um, and certainly like uh, District Merchants, my adaptation of uh, Merchant of Venice, like those plays, the world has changed so much the four and the and there's something sort of quaint about the form either quaint with the check off or sort of distant with the with the shakespeare that felt like if when one is confronted with doing those plays today you either you you end up pushing the play around a lot or it just isn't speaking directly to to an audience today so it's when it's when i find a work that I love that truly does that I think is worthwhile and complicated and is creating a sort of uh, a playground if you will like yeah. a, a a kind of inquiry that I'm engaged by but that I also don't but I don't but I think is too distant or too broken or too something that I don't think I can uh, that it speaks directly to our moment um, that's when I find myself going um, 
uh, how else can I, how can I make a bridge there? How can I take my own sensibility as a person living in this world today and, and reimagine um, this work in a way that will speak to audiences now? And, I, and it's a process that I really love. And now you have JQA, which is not an adaptation. Oh. Right? I mean, right. I mean, more or less, like it's imagined. I know you say so yourself, a series of fictitious encounters between John right. Quincy Adams, um, et cetera. And so uh, you're, you didn't take a pre-existing text uh, and, and transcribe these conversations. These came purely out of your imagination, based obviously on your knowledge of perhaps who these people were. Um, and what inspired you to do that? Well, the in, what, being commissioned by somebody is a really oh, good well, that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So with, but with, with Molly Smith at Arena Stage as part of their power plays asked me if I was interested in doing something about politics. And I said, absolutely. And when I presented her projects, I presented her five possibilities, four of which were adaptations mm -hmm. and one of which was JQA. And I, and I did lead with JQA and I had a feeling that it was the one that she might choose because I think it was the fullest and probably the best idea. But it was, um, but I, I presented it with nervousness because I just, it, it hadn't been a thing I've, you know, as a person who started as a director and as an adapter of prose fiction, um, doing novels and short stories and very much serving somebody else's vision, that's where I've always felt comfortable. Yeah. Um, and then as I got into doing the Chekhov adaptations and into the other adaptations, um, it became a melding of like, okay, I'll borrow this playground and structure, but now I'll begin to bring in much more of my own sensibility. So Stupid Fucking Bird and Life Sucks and District Merchants, they are some interesting hybrid of the original and very much me, but I had never taken the step to go, okay. And even, even uh, JQA, while it is all original work and every word of it is mine, right. um, it still is, it, I still didn't quite leave it all behind because I still built off of historical characters. Um, but it is, it was, it was never my intention to make an accurate representation of George Washington or, or, you know, Henry Clay or even John Quincy Adams, inspired by, touched off by, but, you know, uh, historic. Although I did, you know, I, I originally headed into it going like, I'm not going to care whether they're even close. Like, I'm just going to sort of co-op them in a way yeah. that'll be fun. The more research I did and the more I got to know, the more I went, you know what is more interesting is to, while these scenes, while, while we have no belief that these scenes happened, I don't, I would like to make it so that nothing in them violates anything that could have happened. Ah. So, um, so the timelines are correct. The, uh, the you know, uh, John Quincy Adams and Abraham Lincoln did overlap in Congress for about two months um, before John Quincy Adams died. So that, like, so they're all feasible. They are all, and they all build off of, um, you know, my basic knowledge of the personalities and the energy of these historical characters. Absolutely. But again, but 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 since my goal was never historical, but always, to, you know, because it, I think it's just pretty clear, I'm really writing about today. I'm writing about. Um, what I'm observing and what I'm feeling about um, about the political about our relationship to government now, um, it was always a, like, how can I engage with these people that will help me move towards something to talk about what's going on right now? Yeah, um, if I may, you do it brilliantly in the play. Oh gosh, thank you. Out of curiosity, what were the other three adaptation ideas that you proposed to Molly? <laughs> <laughs> Um, I would have to go back and look at them. One of them was uh, a lot. Yeah, one of them though was um, God bless you, Mr. Rosewater, Kurt Vonnegut's, uh, an old Kurt Vonnegut novel from the 60s, I think that I love. Um, and that I think would be would, it, it is a piece that has always stayed with me that I've always wanted to work on. That's the only one that I remember right now. There. Oh, um, one that I will still that I'm still trying to get done, but I can't get the rights for. Oh. Um, <laughs> it's a movie. There's a movie that I would love to adapt ah. um, into a musical, but uh, but that one's but out. not yet in eminent domain. <laughs> <laughs> not, not not mine to deal with yet. But so, um, and there are others now. There are some other political pieces now. I mean, JQA 
uh, got my mind going on the sort of political world. And so there's also been, there's one or two new pieces now that I'm in the midst of exploring that really came out of my research for JQA as I started looking at sort of our identity. You know, this is obviously a time when we're all thinking, when no matter where you sit on whatever spectrum you sit on, if there's a, if there's a sort of common pursuit across all categories, it says we're all grappling with what it means to be an American right now and what a real American mm -hmm. is and what patriotic means and how to, how we identify as American or don't identify or what that word means to us when we choose or no, don't choose to wear it. I think that, that I, my guess is that cuts across every, <laughs> every line. And so, um, yeah, and so that, you know, so that's a particular, that's a place that I'm really engaged right now. Yeah, I'll bet. Yeah. Why John Quincy Adams? Well, I, the, well, I mean, the, the real story is uh, what I wanted to write about when Molly first asked me, and this is about five years ago now, I think that's about right, four or five years ago. Well, whatever it was, let's see, this is, this is 2020, 2016. So it was 2015, because it was the run up to the election was when this began and what so at first I wanted to write about um I had read a great book called Don't Think About an Elephant by George Lakoff who's a linguist and he was trying and he was um talking about why is it that all of these things why pro-choice pro-environment anti-death penalty pro-big government why are those all liberal and why are the opposite all conservative like who says that you can't be pro, and of course there are times when you have a pro-environment, pro-choice, like there are times when those things cross over, but for the most part, most liberals will line up on all of these 12 issues and most conservatives on all of these 12. And he was like, why is that? And he was pre presenting a sort of a, a framework for, for that, um, which I found, and what he presents, I found really interesting. So I wanted to sort of write about that. So I wanted to find, a historical figure to, to hang it onto that was before we were uh, chosen up teams into our current sides of Democrat, Republican, conservative, liberal. So I was looking sort of pre-Civil War for sure. And then I was like even in, in, into the founding fathers. And while I was doing that work, I read an article by E.J. Dion from the Brookings Institute who writes for the Washington Post who talked about John Quincy Adams as an underexplored, underappreciated president. And I was like, well, I certainly He's certainly somebody who I know his name and that's all. Right. <laughs> and so once I, once I read a little bit about him, the other thing that I thought was, oh, look, how interesting the son of a former president, the son of our second president, part of a kind of political dynasty. And since the next election is probably going to be Hillary Clinton and Jeb Bush, wouldn't it be interesting to be writing about another political dynasty family if the next election <laughs> is going to be Jeb Bush and Hillary Clinton? Wow. Um, of course, it didn't quite work out that way. Um, but, that's what, so, but that's part of what's made JQA seem like an interesting idea to me. So, um, that's amazing. So, so you've given me as sorry. the... Um, oh, I'm sorry. I, did I interrupt you? No, no. Um, as the casting director of this theater company, you've given me probably the most fun casting exercise I've ever had. Oh, good. Um, and, uh, you know, every season I look at, you know, we obviously we come up with the plays, et cetera. And secretly in my brain, I'm like, oh, which one, which one am I most excited to cast? <laughs> and this one was the most exciting to cast. Um, and unfortunately, we, act, we were uh, in the middle of callbacks. For, and Sam, who, as you know, is slated to direct, um, hadn't even met any of the actors, right? So just a typical oh. casting process. I was doing the first round, and then callbacks were going to go to him him and me so uh we hadn't um gotten to that point yet and so by the time lockdown happened in san diego um we were i had let's see i was in the process of of doing my first first or second round of callbacks can't remember but we have since obviously given the world of technology been able to uh get videos mm -hmm. and even the videos are fun mm -hmm. and the number of actors who have come to me and said oh my god 
this was some of the best material I've ever auditioned with, you know, because I, I was able to sort of spread the wealth in a way that um, isn't typical. So women were obviously auditioning for men. Um, African-American actors were, uh, you know, portraying these Southern racists. And, you, know, you know, and yes, there is a little bit of that, like, and I'm sure you've heard this to some degree, a little bit of that Hamilton device happening. Um, yeah. But there's, some, there's something about the depth of your language that is really unique and allows these actors to just have so much fun. So um, just for the sake of, you know, sharing with our eventual audience, mm -hmm. um, I'm just gonna read the little, you know, preface that you give about casting. The play is built for four actors of various ages, gender, and ethnicities. Each actor plays JQA in turn as he ages and moves through his life and career. The role is passed from actor to actor interstitially. There may, be well, there may well be other ways of doubling or dividing things up. I am open. And by the way, to even say out loud as a playwright, I am open. Very cool. <laughs> um, and so, it, so yes, so four actors and, um, you know, some things are kind of, of uh, organic to what they're doing in the scene. Um, but let me, let me just ask you, like, wh why? Why do it that way? Well, I suppose it would, I mean, you know, it evolved. It wasn't the, it, it, it's not, it's very funny as a person who, again, started as a director before being really, and I really started doing both at the same time, but certainly the kind of playwright I am now, where I actually think of my, for the first 20 years that I was writing adaptations, I never called myself a playwright unless I was applying for a playwriting fellowship. Other than that, I, I really thought of myself as a director who adapted literature for himself to direct. Um, in the last 10 years, really post Stupid Fucking Bird, I now do think of myself as a playwright, and I'm proud of the things that I've been able to build. And, um, but as someone who does both, I really don't think about the productions when I'm writing. I, I really am writing in a certain kind of headspace that's very different from directing. So I wrote the scenes and I wrote the plays not thinking about cast, about what to do. And then once I had all of these scenes with John Quincy Adams, and I began going like, well, what do you do across ages and across, and how large a cast? And the moment that, and at one point it was non-sequential. Non I didn't have it happening chronologically. I had it happening kind of more thematically. But there was a moment in which I was talking to someone and it wasn't any, it was a friend. And, uh, and I was talking about, it's a really an American story. It's about the American relationship. I started saying, it's not really about John Quincy Adams. It's about all, of, uh, it's all of us as Americans and our relationship to government. And somewhere in that sentence or so, I went, oh, right. It's about all Americans and our relationship to government. Therefore, if we could actually look a little like America, that would probably be better. And that was when I sort of went like, oh, what if we were to go? And let's be honest, if Hamilton hadn't happened, I probably, that idea might have felt too far-fetched to me. It might have felt like a bridge too far. It might not have received the kind of response it did when I went to arena with it. And they all went, yes. Um, you know, immediately they loved the idea. So, I, you know, very few, um, you know, Lin-Manuel Miranda is one of the great, you know, he's the Shakespeare of our time, I sort of feel right now, like, <laughs> there aren't that many amazing innovators who take us forward, but I followed that. I mean, I, there was something about that that was so, that was inspiring. And even though this idea didn't occur to me in direct relation to that, I have to imagine that this probably wouldn't have shown up in my head had I not had that experience. Um, but once, and then once I did that and you, and it was also a way of saying, this is not about John Quincy Adams, nor is it about any of these guys. This is a way of saying, hey, whatever you're watching, please don't get too involved in the biography or whether, or this, this is really about, that's not the point. The point is, who are we in relation to our government? What do we want from our government? How does our government really function? And I wanted a way to keep our focus on the big, picture and not on this not on the small and i and by by having you know and the moment you have a woman play george washington and having you know uh 
you know, and then as soon as we started playing with it, we had these moments, these sort of chilling moments there, you know, one of my favorite moments in the play in our, in the original production, at least, was this moment when uh, a young Latina actress as Abraham Lincoln is speaking to an older actress, older white actress as John Quincy Adams and introduces herself as I'm Abraham, I'm, I'm, the name is Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln. And there was something about, I'm putting, you know, we're putting this young Latina actress playing Abraham Lincoln on stage at Arena Stage, one of the premier, you know, mm -hmm. historic, you know, groundbreaking theaters in America, felt really like, oh, this is the right thing in the world right now, so. Absolutely. Well, one thing I'm really looking forward to, and unfortunately, when, in, you know, this age of COVID, who knows what's right. gonna happen, but I really do hope that I have an opportunity to be in a room watching live actors do this because what I sort of expect from that experience is that there's the experience of the play and the story that it is telling in the individual scenes as you've written them. And then there's the story of the language of those characters coming from the bodies of Americans today, mm -hmm. right? There's something really profound about that. And for me as a woman of color, um, watching uh, people who look like me um, and people who have sort of, you know, trafficked in the world uh, in, a, in a particular way, to be able to own those, that language, that language of American ideals, American aspirations, there's something incredibly profound and emotional about it, to watch that. And talking so, to, yeah, talking I'm really to the, looking forward to that. Talking to the young gentleman, the African American actor who played, you know, uh, 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 Douglas, but also played Jackson, yeah. um, to have him say, "Who would have ever thought that Andrew Jackson would be one of my dream roles?" <laughs> you know, <laughs> it was like, like it was like that. That I didn't expect that. So you know. So yeah. Was, uh, well, it's interesting. I had um, a fair number of actors who were obviously so thrilled, so so thrilled to to be able to just audition with this material. Right. And then there were just, not a lot, but there were a couple who, you know, and I was careful to make sure everybody had the material right. in advance so that they could read it. And I even advised, which I sort of expect everyone to anyway, if they're professionals, they'll read the play before they audition for it. But this right. one, I was like, please advise your clients, you know, to their agents. Right. Sure. They must read this before they audition. They must right. know what, what the expectations are. And sure enough, I had a couple people decline. Mm -hmm. um, and like I said, not a lot, not a lot, but notable, right? So, mm -hmm. so it's interesting, again, um, to, to imagine what that is like, to have the words like slavery is a, a great thing, or however it is that you say yeah. it, right? I mean, a positive it, good. Exactly, right. It was actually stolen. It was actually, it, it's actually, a, it's a quote from John Calhoun who ended up, who was in the play, but it was taken out at some point. There was a Calhoun scene. But, you know, there is something chilling just to say that, right? No, no, <laughs> you're wrong. Slavery is a positive good who had this incredibly paternalistic view of like, what would they do without us? You know, is just horrifying. <laughs> yes, it makes, it makes, you know, as a as a playwright and a director, I do have a pretty strong desire to be liked, and I uh, and I um, and I try and work against that. But well, you know, I mean, like it's it's not uncommon. But um, but you know, I if, unless you're pushing it, 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 the fact that some people you know either see it or read it and go like, I see what you're trying to do, but this is not for me, or this takes me too far, or I'm not prepared for this. That seems. I hope that that's encouraging because it means we're playing up to a boundary someplace that we're that we're stepping up to a line that says like I think this is worthwhile and believe me you know Arena Stage is a very diverse organization and a very careful and respectful organization and there was a lot of like conversation around the yeah. like we tried to be really not not careful timid but careful respectful um, at at all the steps in the journey so. Um, I was reading your artistic or artist statement on the um, new play exchange. Oh. And oh, I don't know how long ago you wrote that. <laughs> I should I should probably look at that see if see no. what I think of it. Um, no, the one, that, well, it can't be can't be too long ago. So it <laughs> the one thing that stood out to me was your actually how you wrapped it up. 
I write quickly. <laughs> oh, is that what it says? Yes. Well, <laughs> Which I love. <laughs> well, it's true. And I do, um, I, I, uh, I do write quickly. I write from, uh, once I know what I'm doing, I write very slowly. If you, if you take all the time, if you take all, if you take into account all the time I spend thinking about what it is I'm trying to do, which I can't write until I sort of have a sense of where I'm going. But once I, um, once I know who these people are, um, or, and what it is I'm going through, that once I start writing for whatever reason, it, it, I do tend to write in a kind of, um, in a kind of rush. And most of the scenes in JQA, um, they're not first drafts. Every one of them was revised and revised right. multiple yeah. times. But the structure of them and the impulse of them are almost all uh, pretty close to the way I wrote them when they began. Because that tends to be what happens is I don't write anything until suddenly I get an idea or an image or a thing that I want to accomplish. And then it tends to pour out pretty fast. Yeah. Um, do you have any kind of... Um... Well, first of all, how long did it take to develop JQA? Like how, from, from the moment you, you know, put pen to paper or you started typing away to the moment, like you had the draft that maybe I have now. <laughs> oh, uh, well, that, I mean, that's over a couple of years. I mean, it was about, I think from the time I started writing till the time I had a, a, a I think it was about a year. It took me about, this is this, I mean, this one, I, I didn't know, I, I started writing some of the scenes I mean, there's a, oh, it's more than a year because it was, um, because I did something that was I'd never done before. Also, I was just starting as an adjunct um, professor, just uh, as a kind of resident guest artist at American University. And I actually created a play there called JQA, A Theatrical Inquiry. And it was uh, that I developed with the students and with a co-director. And um, the students wrote, and we actually built a play based off of their impressions of JQA and his family. Mm. And this play, was uh, several scenes and monologues. It was actually narrated by John Quincy Adams' two sons who died early. Okay. Um, it was because it was about, because it was written or sort of inspired by college students, it was actually about the difficulty of high family expectations on young people. <laughs> So it became very much out of their experience. And it was something that, and that's still in the play in terms of John Quincy Adams and his parents and yes. his and his difficulties with his sons. It's still in there, but it was a very different play. Although there were prototypes of the Lincoln scene and the Jackson scene were both in that version. And then, um, and actually I'll, I will say the first performance of it, uh, and, and the first performance of that um, JQA Jackson scene that takes place, you know, the day before the inaugural, the first performance of it was the day that Obama met with uh, Trump at the White House just before Trump took office. Um, so it was a kind of a one of those moments of like, this is very strange since of course Trump referenced Andrew Jackson as a hero and has a picture of Andrew Jackson in his office. And, um, yeah, I know it's 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 a little beyond. Uh, yeah. Beyond um, <laughs> but then and then I and so then but that was an interesting exploration of which I learned a lot and then I really started from scratch again. So um, it was a long process because again I didn't I I I had been used to always having a novel or a play or something to to hang everything on as I as I you know I didn't have to come up with a structure and so figuring out the structure I worked with Jocelyn Clark who's the resident dramaturg at Arena Stage who's actually Irish but he's brilliant and so helpful and he um but everyone uh, uh I love that you said Irish but he's brilliant <laughs> <laughs> no I mean Mo Molly and Seema Sueco and I love Seema um, Vic, uh, Victor, who's a casting director there, or was the casting director there. There was a, uh, 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 Nason, who was the dramaturg. There was a lot of smart people around helping to push and to question and, uh, and uh, help it uh, find its way. And we did a number of readings. I mean, you know, Arena was incredibly, incre they, were, they, were, um, they were kind of perfect. Yeah. actually, in terms of what you would want from an organization, helping you give birth to something that was complicated and out, certainly outside my comfort zone. It was outside my comfort zone before the casting. And then once you added the, compl the, the complexities of this casting across race and across gender, then it was, you know, because uh, even as I had the idea, I went, I'm having that idea as a, as a white, straight <laughs> Jewish male. And 
that I, while I think the idea is interesting and worthwhile, I, it still makes me nervous because yeah. there, because of there's, there's obviously questions of representation and that you want to be uh, just smart about these things. Of so course. I, I, I was very fortunate to have a lot of excellent help. You've mentioned that you have a desire to engage with uh, a contemporary audience in your adaptations and now with JQA. When you're writing, as you're writing, do you find that what's happening outside is somehow seeping into your brain and coming out on the page at all? Always. Yeah. And, and as I was finishing JQA, the world was changing so much. And so it was, it was, I was partially rewriting and I am now having, a, a, since you, since you guys have requested a, a an additional piece, <laughs> um, I am, I'm, in, I'm engaged in that piece right now, which turns out is uh, it, right. It, we'll see what, it, what, it, what happens, but right now I'm engaging with James Madison oh. um, uh, and JQA and, um, and talking about not COVID, but really about where we are, I think where where some people are in this country in terms of our president, in terms of our leadership, and how we're sort of coping with that. Um, but yeah, whatever is happening in the world, no matter what I'm writing, I mean, I can you know, uh, it, it, you know, I, I'm intensely interested in 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 how we are, how we live our lives. You know, it's. Uh, my model for so much is, you know, I direct a lot of Shakespeare and I love Shakespeare. And so, you know, uh, Shakespeare was, you know, he could set things in Illyria or Rome or Italy or Greece or, you know, he set things wherever, but he was always writing about Elizabethan England. He was always writing about home. And I think that's what most of us are doing, no matter where we set these things. So, yeah, this is JQA, but I'm writing about what's going on with my friends and myself in the world right at this moment. And, you know, the way you conclude the piece, um, and I, I won't, you know, share the conclusion or, or how it's written, but um, those words, are they, are they yours? <laughs> the, the end of the play? Are yeah. they, or, or is that a quote? I mean, I guess, I guess it's just so beautiful and in a way incredibly um, simple. Did you, did you, coin a term or did, were you was that you i know that's me i wish i wish um that could be you know the slogan for well just how people behave now i i you know i look around and i think wow because i have children do you have children i do i have an age yeah and so you know we can't help but think about what is the future that's being set up for them yeah. and the way the very poignant and also very powerful way that you end the play is, um, you know, it, it, it really resonates on a very deep parental level, um, but also on a personal level as far as how do we, how do we forge ahead, you know, especially in this new world. And, um, and so I, I was just wondering if, if how much of you is in your writing, how much of you personally a lot. I mean, I think a lot. A lot of the things that um, I think a lot of all of me, right? Because there is, there is. Um, uh, I think my best angels and my worst demons are all in there, because there are there are because um, some of the opinions and some of the attitudes of these characters actually come from these historical people and from their. Um, excellent and terrible impulses, but some of them are are my own as well. You know putting stuff in there that I, that makes the things that make, that I feel best about myself in the world. And, you know, trying to teach my daughter, it all comes down to like going, oh, wow, all you teach is all you, on some level, the golden rule is just everything, you know? And of course, if our government could follow the golden rule, we would be a very different country. Um, <laughs> but, um, and, you know, and, and the, these ideas of, um, you know, and, and I, try, and then I try and steal well, like, you know, the, the, the Frederick Douglass scene, the, this idea of um, the idea behind that, I've stolen from a philosopher named John Rawls. You know, I try and things that I read, I go like, oh, I can take this and, and, re, and reshape this and hopefully help people. You know, if you can just, you know, there was a really one of the, the, we were two days into previews and we were still making changes. And 
at Arena, the third, I think it was the third preview audience, there was a group of about 100, and maybe 100 or so, 150 high school students. Mm. I think they were from Florida, from like Gainesville, Florida or something. Mm. And in this, uh, and it was an amazing group just to see because it was a diverse group. Mm -hmm. It was black and brown and white, and there was a several red hats, Matt, you know, make oh, America. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. There was, there was, Trump, there was like diehard Trump people, and then there was a lot of diversity, and, um, and the students were not very interested in being at the play, it felt like, and I was like, and, and I did that thing where I'm like, oh, no, this is going to be a disaster. <laughs> but um, as I sat watching the play and watching the audience, I watched them get engaged. I watched them sort of uh, begin puzzling things out. And when I talked to a group, I, I couldn't help it. I just sort of wandered down into them right after the play and said, can I talk to them? And I talked to about 20 of the students and said, can I just ask you what you thought? And the responses were smart and complicated. And they were from the Trump people and from the people, the, like from, from, the, from, a, from a cross section. It was really, it was, you know, and I had, I had, it had been my ambition to say like, I don't need to just tell everyone who agrees with me exactly why we're all so smart. And the goal had been to say, like, no, can we actually talk about the real issues, but but um, but try and be honest as as honest as possible from every side. And so to feel like that was actually heard, I was I was really pleased about. You know, that actually gives me um, a lot of hope. And and lately, uh, <laughs> so last night I was watching the Michelle Obama documentary, becoming oh, amazing. I well, you know, she's just you know incredible but there there's several scenes of her engaging with young people and i was getting emotional and i i realized like wow uh, i think that the the idea that this generation is growing up in this world uh, in this current time and in you know this year we have an entire generation of graduating seniors who can i mean presumably can vote right this fall um and the things she was telling those young people and now hearing you and how you were engaging with those young people, that gives me a, a lot of hope for the future. Um, I don't, you know, my, my daughter's in high school and so, so we're constantly talking about these ideals and politics, et cetera. Um, and, um, and so I, I, am, I am heartened to know that, that you had this experience with, you know, people wearing red hats and yeah. that you came away feeling like perhaps you, you know, shaped the way they saw things a little bit. Yeah, I don't know that I would, I, I, I don't know how hopeful I am that that's the case, although it, it, it has inspired me that the next thing I do in this arena, I would like to go, you know, it's, it's hard to be, you know, you sort of find yourself thinking whatever your place on the spectrum is, on the political spectrum, you end up thinking like, well, my position is very, very reasonable <laughs> and other people's positions are right? less reasonable than mine. <laughs> and then you have to, so you have to ask yourself, what would it take for me to change my position? Like, how do we actually change our positions and how is it that we can be affected? Because if we only is expect them to be affected because they're so wrong and we're so right, nothing will ever happen. So where is there common ground? Are there things that you can meet on? Are there places where you can um, open yourself to an actual exchange of ideas and see like, you know, that's where the, um, yeah. So, so uh, I'm interested in trying to push that conversation further even. Was that ever a driving force behind your art, changing things? Of course. You know? I mean, like, you like, um, I, you know, when, you <laughs> when you're young, there the belief of like, I will change the world, I will change <laughs> people's minds. And, um, and, you know, Shaw's my favorite playwright. And if I was as brilliant as Shaw, I would probably be more effective at changing people's minds. I don't think I ever, I don't want to change people's minds. Um, I would like, if I, I guess my highest ambition is to uh, challenge people to challenge themselves or mm -hmm. challenge people to say like, do, can you look at this from a wider perspective or a broader perspective or can you see this differently so that you can be more open to a conversation and more open to engagement? Um, I think that's the, that's what I'm hoping for. You know, it's funny, I have to tell you the other night, um, so, you know, there are characters in JQA that 
to my mind, you know, they're just fascinating and fun to watch, but they're also kind of despicable yeah. <laughs> and, um, uh, or fun to listen to. I mean, I'm watching them in my head as I'm reading it. Um, but the other night, uh, you know, in classic sort of family style, um, I have two kids, a boy and a girl. And, and so my husband and I, we were arguing, like, what movie are we going to watch tonight? And it became this huge fight. And, um, and then I don't know what we decided. But then later that night when the kids were in bed, Jason, my husband, goes, you know, it's exactly what Henry Clay said in JQA. <laughs> All right, right. You know, do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, the sure, moment sure. where he's like, my family cannot decide on what book to read after dinner and what makes you think that the country can decide. <laughs> yeah, totally. Well, that's, that, that, you know, I, I remember having this, like, when I was studying, I think it came when I was first studying communism. And I thought, like, communism, what a great idea. But it, <laughs> but it, like from each according to their ability to each according to their need. That's awesome. But I can't, but, but it, that's hard in a family of three, <laughs> you know I mean? let, let alone an extended family, let alone a country or a city. Like, really, you're going to make that work. I don't want it. Like my brother, it's nice that my brother shares with me, but like, you know, you know right. he doesn't have to like, it's, it's very, you know, like these uh, extent, ex you know, there's a, uh, extending these ideas beyond the and you know and, and and that idea of sort of family metaphor comes back in jqa a lot because yeah. it's really it's a really powerful one that if you do think of the country as a family you begin to go like oh there are all of these forces that make families so complicated and those are the same forces that push on a country just you know expand it out to this sort of absurd degree I know, I know. And I think that's, <laughs> that was, that's why, I mean, one of the many reasons why I just actually love your play so much is because it does strike me <laughs> on a really uh, personal and real hashtag real life level sure. um, where I can go, oh yeah, I know exactly what they're talking about. Um, and yet it's also these very lofty conversations about, you know, bigger, bigger ideas. Um, and so I, I do think that there are moments where you go, huh, yeah, that makes sense. And then there are moments where it's like, wait, I shouldn't agree with that guy, but I kind of do. Right. <laughs> that's, the, that's the hope. I mean, so that's the hope. When you suddenly find yourself, when Andrew Jackson makes a point that you go, oh. <laughs> that, is that kind of right? You know, like that's always, that's, that's wonderfully um, terrifying. And by the way, um, you know, you mentioned as like your, your sort of inherent caution in navigating certain issues as a, as a white man, as a white straight male in this field, in this, in this art form. Um, but the way you wrote Louisa? Oh, well that's, that was... um, I have a home dramaturg. <laughs> um, that helps, right? <laughs> Well, the, the <laughs> so many of my best ideas are actually my wife's best ideas. And certainly when it comes to the writing of women, um, uh, this has happened on a number of my plays. Um, I'm very proud of the women in my play Life Sucks, which is my version of Uncle Vanya. Yeah. The women I think are particularly interesting and are, are, I'm really proud of them because they didn't, that's not how good they were in the first draft or the second <laughs> draft. But I have a lot, not only my wife, but a lot of very smart, very um, uh, helpful women in my life that help that help me uh, that help me navigate those uh, those th that territory. So, how are you as a collaborator, though? I mean, you know, you are it's your name on these plays, but I, it sounds like you you take in a lot of feedback and a lot of uh, well, no. not collaboration necessarily, but other voices. Um, uh, you know, of course, you'd always have to ask my collaborators how I am. I am flaw. I am deeply flawed, and of course, ego gets in the way. But um, since I am not a genius, there are genius playwrights out there. You know, the Sarah Rules of the world. Yeah. Who I, you know, when that you have this kind of wild, incredible, organic imagination of yes. of uh, that. Um, I'm a playmaker and a play builder and. A, play constructor and um, I have some ideas but I need my collaborators I really um, I'm a good collaborator because I'm very aware of my shortcomings and I uh, I try and get as many smart people who will agree and disagree with me around me as possible and I try and keep learning and I you know um, 
I have a good friend, a wonderful actress here in DC, Holly Twyford, who at some point in her career, she's a wonderful actress, won all of these awards, blah, blah, blah. But at some point she was like, I'm not, I'm not going to do plays anymore unless they scare me. Mm. And, um, and I really respected that opinion. And I sort of, that's not, it's not entirely true that every, because I need to make a living, so I'll do other plays that don't necessarily scare me. But the idea of continually growing and continually trying to stretch yourself, and that's very hard to do without collaborators that will help push you. So I, 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 uh, I mean, all joking aside, my, much of my best work comes because of the different, and my wife and I don't always collaborate easily. Like there's, there's complexity to it, but, um, but my plays are so much better because of her input and because of people like Jocelyn and, and like the folks at Arena and the folks at many, you know, um, and the actors, you know, actors are often, um, I don't know, relegated a little bit to like, oh, they do their job really. But, you know, you get, there's certainly in this community and certainly wherever I've worked, I've worked with such smart actors who teach me so much about my plays. I mean, one of the most fascinating things to learn as a playwright is that you're not necessarily an expert on your own play. Like you wrote, like just because I, you know, I found that when I, you know, JQA, I wrote and directed the premiere of. And, par and partially that happened, that hadn't been the original intention, but the play was still sort of finding its own way enough that Molly, uh, it was her who actually said, Molly Smith, who said, I think you probably better direct this one. And I think that was partially, she, she thought I would do a good job. And also because she was like, it's not ready for anybody else to direct it. Like it, you, you need to sort of de continue to develop organically. And, um, but you know, at times, you go like, oh, I wrote it, but that doesn't mean I understand it. I'm writing from a place of sometimes it's instinctual or sometimes it's from an impulse or it's from someplace personal. And so I've often had uh, designers, actors, dramaturgs, literary people sort of say, oh, you see what's going on in this scene. And me go like, oh, wow, I think you're right. That is, that is really going on in there. Yes, I, I knew mean, that. I knew that. <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, I, I, I've been blessed with outstanding collaborators who definitely make my work better. That's great. Did you marry a theater person? I did. She's a wonderful actress. And, uh, and uh, her, her, parents are, her parents are theater people. They're, they're high school drama. Her dad just retired from being a high school drama teacher for 42 years. And wow. her mother is at a high school level. Her brother is one of the best lighting designers in the country. Um, Tom Weaver, he's a wonderful lighting designer, works all over the place. And she's a wonderful actress and, and, uh, and collaborator. And she's, uh, I'm, I'm grateful for her all the time. It sounds like you've started a dynasty. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure on your daughter. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, uh, she's just been cast in her first play that, did, that isn't in rehearsal right now. That, wow. Um, because, of, because of the world right now. But my wife is playing um, Catherine and Pippin up at Olney, and my daughter has been classed as the daughter in that, or what was as the son. So, um, yes! So hopefully that'll happen next summer instead of this next summer. summer. Sure. Yeah. Oh, that's exciting. It it's funny. Our kids, like they do theater for fun. Right. Um, my husband's an actor. And, wow. uh, <laughs> but, but my daughter's like, she wants to be a politician. So I, I, I don't know how that happened, but that's great. I'm like, great. You know, don't be an artist. Be a politician. <laughs> right. That's one way through, through to change, I guess. There you go. But, um, but Aaron, it has been such a pleasure to talk to you and reconnect with you after 17 years. Yeah, that's awesome. That's great. Thank you. Isn't that hilarious? Wow. Anyway. And hopefully, um, I will, hopefully, I mean, I hope the world allows this play to get done in person. And I, I hope agree. I get to, <laughs> if so, I hope I get to see it. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm excited by the conversation with Sam. It sounds like you guys have some uh, exciting ideas. I am I am hard at work on that new scene. So um, so I will uh, let you know when I uh, when I have something to share. That is wonderful. Well, you and your family take good good care, and um, you know we'll see you on the other side of this. Yep. All right. Right back at you. Thank you so much. Bye, bye. Bye, Aaron. Thanks so much.